G'day everyone, it's Scott Allen and welcome to this week's edition of Let's Talk Rugby. We're brought to you by the raw.com.au, Australia's largest sports opinion website. On this week's show we've got a special guest from the Rebels, so we'll find out a little more about how they're preparing for next year's Super Rugby season. We'll have a look at the England-Australia Legends match last week. We'll do a review of the Wallabies' loss to England, and then we'll look forward to the Wallabies' match against Italy this weekend, including getting the thoughts from a guest from Italy. Joining me on the panel today is former Wallaby Matt Cobain, who played 63 tests and is now an assistant coach for the Rebels. G'day, Matt. How are you? Hi, Scott. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks for coming on. No dramas. Also joining us on the panel is Dario Mazzocchi from Italy. He's from the Right Rugby blog. Hi, Dario. Welcome to Let's Talk Rugby. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Matt, it's a busy time for you at the Rebels as you get into pre-season, and there have been a number of coaching changes this year. Obviously, you've continued on but there's a new group. Can you just give us some detail on who's doing what and how it's working? Yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously, as you, uh, you mentioned, it's um, a new start, I guess, for, for the Rebels team. Um, Tony McGann's come in. Um, most people would know him as a Wallabies assistant coach over the last couple of years under Robbie. Uh, he's come in to, to be the head coach, um, taking that role on. Um, I've remained as, uh, as Ford's coach, um, after doing that uh, uh, over the past two years under Damien Hill, and um, with Nathan Gray moving to the Waratahs, uh, we've we've managed to secure Sean Hedger, ex uh, ex Queenslander, uh, looked after the academy up there for, for a few years, and then has spent a lot of time um, over in Japan. And most recently, was was looking after the um, the Sydney uh, ARU academy uh, players. So. He comes with a with a fair bit of experience, and um, we're all sort of working well together now. Hedge Hedge is uh, looking after the backs, obviously, and then obviously Tony's overseeing everything, and and I'm doing the forwards. Great, and preseason's fully underway for you now. Yep, it is. Um, we're uh, we're doing sort of uh, three or four field sessions a, a week. Um, you know, the program's changed a fair bit. We've got a new strength and conditioner, uh, a guy called Bryce Kavanagh, who's coming over from, from Munster Rugby, and uh, he's a he's a former uh, former Sydney uh, person. Um, I think he, he has done a bit of work in uh, up there with the Waratahs Academy, maybe before a few, going back a few years now, and also had a little bit of, to do with the Sydney Swans. So he comes with a lot of experience in sort of managing the program, the performance program. So he's he's got his teeth into the boys at the moment, and they're um, they're working really hard. And you mentioned to me earlier when we were having a chat that it's not only the contact time, obviously, when the boys are there and you're on field. But there's a lot of work for you guys in terms of planning and getting the setup right as well, isn't there? Yeah, it's right. It's huge. As I said, it's it's really, uh, you know, in some ways a, a new start here. We've got a we got another large turnover of players um, coming into the into the team, and and they need to be able to sort of hit the ground running, I guess. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned the planning side of things, just getting pulling the best bits out of what we've done uh, previously with the guys and also trying to and marry that in in, in, in the style that uh, that Tony's after. So, um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of uh, plenty of meetings going on throughout throughout the week. and uh, But it's been good. You know, we've been flat stick. Um, as most, obviously, all the, all the Super Rugby sides are at this time of year and it, it's been enjoyable and everyone's just getting stuck into the work. Yeah, and you mentioned the new recruits and just you know some of the highlights there. You've got Tamati Ellison and Tom Kingston in the backs, and then Toby Smith, Max Laheef, Colby Fainga, and Lepetti Tamani in the forwards. So you got some good pickups there. Yeah, we've, we've done we've done all right there. Obviously, we've we've lost a couple in the backs there in particular. Uh, it's a couple of well known guys um, that, that everyone sort of knows about. But um, look, the pickup guy like Tamati. Uh, He's um he's obviously come comes with a lot of experience, um, you know, an All Black player. Um, Tommy Kingston's been been really impressive in training. Uh, he's 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 trained his, his guts out. He's um you know he's obviously extremely quick as we all know, and, and he's really putting in and contributing to the group. And then those those forwards you mentioned, we actually met Toby Smith for the first time today. He's over here on a, on a bit of a, a break with his um with his fiance, and he and he, and he came in and, and said good day to the guys and. Had had a bite to eat with Tony and myself, um, and um, you know he's he's looking forward to getting stuck in. Obviously, Max Laheef um, has had an ITM campaign with Hawks Bay. Um, um, you actually uh, there's missed you've missed one player there too, Toulouse Vianu, who's uh, who's come in. He's uh, the Hawks Bay winger. 
Um, he's coming to the squad a- as well. So um, he's um, he's only landed this week, and obviously everyone knows about Colby Fanger. He's going to be a great addition, um, and Le Petit Tamani too, obviously um, um, younger brother of, of the big fella in the Wallabies. So he's um, they're all contributing well, training well. Uh, Colby's had a little bit of an injury, but... Um, he, he's scheduled to get back on the, the training park and, and back into full training next week, I think. Okay. And talking of injuries, how's uh, Higgers' injury going? Is, is he back yet? Uh, not fully. No, he's progressing. He's obviously had that shoulder that he did uh, against the Reds. Uh, he had a, a he also had a bit of a hip operation. They, they needed to clean up the joint, the hip joint. Um, and then he was progressing well. He just had a little bit of a calf grab uh, a couple of weeks ago and They've just been cautious with that, obviously, getting him back into running. Um, we've done some contact progressions with him this week on his shoulder, so we're only up to level two of eight, basically, on that. And um, we'll, we'll just keep progressing him fairly slowly. There's obviously no rush with him at the moment, but he is, I saw him actually running today, and he looked, he looked pretty quick. So he's, um, he's itching to get back out there with the boys, obviously. Now, before we review the test match between Australia and England, Let's look at some of the highlights from the Legends match between Australia and England, played just a few days earlier. Organised to celebrate the 10th anniversary of that classic 2003 Rugby World Cup final in Sydney between Australia and England. Johnny Wilkinson wasn't involved, so we didn't have the dramatic finish that we had in 2003. As with all these types of matches, it was played in great spirit. And after the match, one of the guys who played, Will Greenwood, sent out a tweet which I think epitomises what rugby's all about, where he said... Can I give one piece of advice to current England lot? Post-game Saturday, go and sit with your opposite man and have a beer. You can't turn back the clock. So, Matt, there were lots of familiar names in those Legends teams and you've probably played against most of them. Um, A few of them look like they wouldn't be able to play still playing professional rugby. Were were you going to play if you weren't so busy with the Rebels? Uh, Yeah, I actually was down to play. Both uh, Nathan Gray and myself were, um, you know, originally chucked their names down there and... It obviously was dependent on on whether we we would able to get time off from a, from a pre season, but um, yeah, look, it would have been great to run around. Obviously, we had those couple of games against uh, the British Lions Legends um, back in uh, July this year when when the Lions were over touring and they were they were pretty willing affairs. Um, just watching the highlights package of the Legends game, this as you said, there are there are a few guys there that can still cut it. Obviously, Jason Robinson looked sharp. Um, I don't think he'd ever. <laughs> He ever looks like he's slowed down at all, but um, yeah, mate, you wouldn't want to get caught wide trying to tackle him, would you? Well, no, he just he made a couple of our blokes look silly. But uh, I, just watching that package, it was it was interesting. There was the amount of line breaks that were made and not finished off was I, I don't know, it's more than I've ever seen in any match, I reckon. So guys, <laughs> guys are running out of steam, I think, before they made the line. Yeah, and look, the match highlight ha- had to be Steve Thompson's try, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> I actually, when when he started running, I thought, oh, they'll pick him up pretty quickly here, and he kept running and running, and then he had a few mates around him who uh, sort of held our defenders off him a little bit, and then he, um, I think one of the the inside supports sort of ran our our defender who was trying trying valiantly to get there, but uh, just didn't have the speed to get around that guy. Yeah. So, yeah, good luck to him. He's he's obviously stacked on a few kilos, old old Tomo. <laughs> he's got a little bit bigger, hasn't he? I love the way Matt K came on with the oxygen mask for him. Oh, yeah, 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 it's all uh, those games are great, you know. Like they, they are a bit of fun. I, I did notice a few smiles on, on the Aussie's face when he when he managed to score that try, Tomo. So um, yeah, he'll be wrapped with that. He'll be talking about that one for a fair while, I bet. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about the Wallabies match against England on the weekend. The Wallabies did reasonably well in the first half. They were leading thirteen six at half time, and I thought at that stage that they were probably on top. But they didn't score a point in the second half and ended up going down 20-13. to 13. England looked a bit rusty and I think the Wallabies missed a really good opportunity here. Yes, there were some refereeing decisions that impacted on the match and they were terrible decisions, don't get me wrong. But you've got to get on with that, you've got to find a way to deal with it and overcome them. The Wallabies just looked very flat in that second half. Matt, the Wallabies are about to play their 12th Test match of the year and most of the players have been going pretty continuously since February when you take into account Super Rugby, the Lions Series, the Rugby Championship and now onto the end of year tour. Is it hard for players to keep going and maintain their enthusiasm at this time of the year? 
Yeah, look, I think um, what I'd say about that is, is you know, the, the obviously the All Blacks are doing it, uh, the South Africans are doing it. And, you know, most international teams, if, you, if you're an international standard player, you do have to be able to back up week after week and, and be able to, uh, you know, play for 48 weeks of the year or whatever it is, 40 weeks of the year and, and, and have basically live off no pre-season. I, 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 don't, I don't really see you know, much of a way around that, particularly with the program getting more and more jammed up these days. So, um, oh, you know, I wouldn't really use that as an excuse at all. I mean, they, they will be tired, but the teams they're coming up against, uh, you know, they've got their own problems as well, They're either fatigue or they haven't been together that long, as, as in England's case. Um, so, you know, I just think we, we, we disregard that in terms of any sort of excuse. Now, obviously, the scrums are a big talking point in this match, and I've put a video up today on the site at theraw.com.au looking at each of the 17 scrums in the match. I put that video up because the Wallabies were penalised five times in the scrums in the match. And there's been a lot of complaint from Wallabies fans that, in particular, Mako Vunapula was the one that should have been penalised because he was boring in or angling in on Ben Alexander in most of the scrums. Now, no one can say with absolute certainty what was happening in the scrums, but... When I looked at each scrum in detail, you know, I was pretty comfortable that the referee had got the decisions mostly right. Sure, there were some 50-50 calls, but I think the team that was the dominant scrum got the right call, even in those 50-50s. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're a dominant scrum, you deserve the penalty. The Wallabies have been struggling all season with their scrum, and we've seen lots of talk about it. We've heard that it's getting better. We've heard that we might have an advantage this week because we've worked really hard or we've been working under the new laws for longer. I'd really like to see the talk stop. I reckon it's time for action rather than any more talk. And the first action that I think needs to be taken is we've got to try somebody else other than Ben Alexander at tight head prop. No doubt Alexander's been toiling away, putting in the effort, but it just isn't working on the tight head side. Now, he's not totally to blame for the problems in the scrum, but you've got to have a more solid tight head than we've got at the moment. Personally, I'd like to see James Slipper have a crack at tight head and Ben Robinson move to loose head. Let's at least give it a go. Matt, just looking at the way our locks have been packing this year, we've been seeming to, in the Wallaby setup anyway, start with our locks up very high with the backside before we set and then dropping down as we set. I know there's a school of thought that you know that's a, that's one way to go, and then other guys like to see you know their middle row start nice and low and come up. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'll probably I'll probably look at uh, <laughs> in between those split the difference. Like I'd, my whole idea with it is is that if you can hit square into the target, that you're generating the mu- as much go forward force as you can. If you're hitting either down, if your ass is high, and you're hitting down through your shoulders, and you're, some of your force is heading towards the ground. And obviously the reverse, if your hips are low and you're driving in, you might tend to lose a bit of energy upwards. So if you can keep pretty pretty level through hips and shoulders, um, that's that's what I tend to look for. And, and right throughout the scrum shape, in fact, you know, right through from front row to to uh, to, the, to the eight, um, and look at look at keep, keeping similar profiles throughout to to keep it sort of um, all together. Yeah. And look, it's been pretty noticeable, and particularly in that match against England on the weekend, that our back row's coming off very early. That, that's got to be making it hard for our props, hasn't it? Yeah, look, it, it's not ideal. Um, you can, if you flip it the other way around, I, I know they're worried about you know, defending off the, scr- off the scrum because the scrum's under a little bit of pressure, and, and it's, it's one of those catch-22 things. You need to actually be able to contribute and stick in there, even if the scrum's... You know, going backwards a little bit or starting to creak, you've got to be able to stick in there and then still get off and defend. And, and it's a bit of a balance there, but I'd, I'd agree with you. They need to be able to contribute harder to the, or contribute longer to the scrum, not pop their heads up after sort of six seconds or, or seven seconds because, as we've seen in England, did it a couple of times, they'll keep the ball on the back, they'll put a second shove on and they'll just win that penalty. You know, like it's, it's a standard tactic now for the for the northern hemisphere teams and you just watch italy this weekend they i don't reckon they'll play off one scrum as they did last year they'll just keep the ball in the back try and win the penalties and um and and chip away at the scoreboard like that so matt i look i think the wallabies have been having some problems at the breakdown they're they're finding it hard to get quick clean ball and that's stifling their attack 
Uh, in defence, they're not committing a lot of numbers so they can fan out and defend, and there's a purpose behind that. What are your thoughts on how the Wallabies have been performing at the breakdown? Yeah, after watching uh, when watching the English match, it was probably I'd probably describe it as a messy performance at the breakdown. The, the targeting seems a little bit off, and that can sometimes be a function of your ball carry if you're being dominated at the tackle um, and you're not getting a you know good presentation of the ball. That can certainly affect how your uh, your arriving players uh, deal with with any threats over the ball. Um, I think what I'd ha- what I'd say about that is they just need to be more accurate in that area in terms of really targeting the threat over the ball, getting nice, uh, coming in nice and and quick from lateral to square, getting over the top of it, and just really giving them no option to um, to attack it. Uh, England England did a good job uh, from what I saw of trying to just get boots or come even sort of I guess trying to almost bend the rules a little bit, coming around and swinging in from the side at times. Uh, but you've got to be able to deal with that again. You know, if you send another number in uh, to get rid of that threat, then you've got to do that. Um, I think, uh, you know, they'll look at that and, and, and be better next week or this week against Italy, rather. And um, you know, hopefully that, uh, that that shows, again, on the scoreboard with through through retaining the ball for long periods and, and, and building up the uh, – or getting that points, those points ticking over. And in terms of player performance in that match against England, my player ratings were published earlier in the week on the site – but I thought Scott Fardy played very well. It was a real blow when he went off with his concussion. I thought Stephen Moore was good. And James Hall responded very well to being dropped during the week. Obviously, he was dropped from the starting team. And when you're not in the starting team, you can't be the captain. And then later in the week, he was reinstated to the starting team once Rob Simmons has hurt his knee. But like I said, I thought he responded very well. I was very disappointed with Sidalecki Tamani just didn't have the impact that I think he, you know, a guy that size really should have around the park. There's always been questions about his work rate and people have lauded the fact that he makes you know, the occasional big hit. There's just not enough of it for me and they're very occasional. In fact, I thought he was quite poor in contact. And I look, I think Ben Moen is struggling. He's obviously played a lot of rugby. Maybe he's one of the players that needs a rest. He's not appearing to be a test number eight he's got no impact when he carries the ball he's just not got the form that he had earlier in the season even when he's been playing number six he's just not showing what we saw from him earlier in the year and and I understand that being switched between eight and six all the time might be disruptive Michael Hooper played well there is the question that continues as to whether he's got the physicality at the breakdown I certainly think when David Pocock is back next year that Michael Hooper is going to be on the bench. As good a player as he is, I think the Wallabies are really missing the impact from David Pocock. In terms of the back line, I thought the back line performed fairly well. They weren't getting the front football they needed from the forwards. The exception there is the halfbacks, and both Will Genier and Nick White were really poor. I know that the argument may be that it's because of the forwards, but they both played poorly. Over the next three weeks, Italy face Australia, Fiji and then Argentina. There's been 17 test matches between Australia and Italy since 1973 and Australia have never lost. Captain and number 8 Sergio Parisi, prop Martin Castro Giovanni and lock Marco Bortolemi are all closing in on 100 tests so there's plenty of experience in the Italian squad. In this year's Six Nations, Italy beat both France and Ireland and finished fourth which is their best position ever in the Six Nations. They then played in a quadrangular tournament in South Africa in June where they were beaten badly by Samoa and South Africa before losing by one point to Scotland. Their coach Jacques Brunel admitted that that was a bit of a setback for them and he's demanding that they get back to the form they showed in the Six Nations. So Dario, 12 months ago Australia beat Italy in a pretty close match, 22-19 and that was after Okero missed a penalty from pretty much in front at about 40 metres out to tie the match up. The Wallabies in that match were helped by a massive penalty count in their favour and, and I thought they really only dominated for the first 30 minutes and, and then Italy came back and I thought were on top for most of the match. They just couldn't take advantage to finish off some good opportunities. That performance must have really encouraged fans in Italy. 
Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, even if uh, I think that what really encouraged our supporters uh, were the matches played uh, in the Six Nation uh, when we won uh, uh, against France uh, in the first match of the tournament uh, and then uh, uh, against Ireland. Yes, of course, that match uh, we played very well, especially in the second half, uh, maybe because uh, Australia didn't play well. Uh, didn't play as much well as much as well uh, uh, in the first time in the first half, uh, and uh, so we we were quite confident uh, on our team. And what sort of game is Jacques Brunel trying to impose on the team? Is it primarily forwards orientated, or is it a more expansive game? From my point of view, he is still trying to uh, to work on our game plan. I mean, uh, of course, uh, uh, the scrum is very important is absolutely important uh, in this game and in the rugby uh, and with the new rules uh, uh, is getting uh, more and more important. Uh, he is trying to explore uh, a more expensive game. It's not easy, we know it's not easy. Uh, we didn't play it in this way before uh, so it's uh, something new for us uh, and uh, I think we he start, he's trying to working uh, on this aspect, uh, um, harder and harder. But if you want to do it, uh, you must have a good scrum. This is what we have. Uh, but if you want to improve uh, playing uh, for all the parts of the, of the pitch, of the ground, you must have absolutely good scrum. So I think he is working in this way too. So Dario, I think most Australians would be aware of Sergio Parisi and Martin Castro Giovanni as key players for the Italian team. But can you give us, say, another two players that are keys for Italy this weekend? Well, since they play in the back row with uh, alongside uh, alongside Sergio Parise, I would say uh, Alessandro Zanni and uh, Robert Barbieri. Uh, they both play for Benetton Treviso, so they play in the Pro 12. Uh, they have good experience. They are very talented guys. Well, they are very good. They are very, very good. Our back row is uh, is very, very good because they have uh, all the skills required from the mod for modern rugby. Uh, they are good fetchers. They are good uh, ball carriers. So I think uh, they will show their strength in the match against uh, Australia. Okay. Well, we'll watch for them. Now it's obviously hard to know how Italy are going to perform given it's the first match they've had for some months together. But Australia, on the other hand, have been playing together regularly and obviously had a game last weekend. Do you see that as a big disadvantage for Italy? Uh, the biggest disadvantage in this moment is Australia. I mean, um, I think you know uh, things are not going uh, very well for you uh, in this moment. Uh, you're trying to find your way. I mean, you're trying to, to win, uh, to, to get a convincing win uh, in, uh, uh, in this last period. So, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't really care about the fact, uh, I mean, it's not important for me in this moment, uh, the fact that this is the first test match we played since last June. But uh, uh, I'm most concerned uh, in what Australia could do uh, this Saturday, because I think uh, uh, this team wants to show that, uh, uh, I mean, Wallabies are still a strong uh, and competitive team uh, and the, they have this opportunity against uh, a, a national team which is not uh, England, which is not uh, Wales, uh, which is not New Zealand of course and uh, so uh, I'm most concerned about this aspect of, uh, of the match. Matt, as Dario mentioned, the Italians are obviously going to be having a bit of a focus on the scrum, the breakdown, they're obviously pretty confident about their back row. We know that Scott Fardy's out after his concussion last week and there are reports that Rob Simmons and Tatafu Pilota now are available. I'm expecting that they'll be included in the 23 this week. Do you think we can afford to rest players or have the Wallabies got to make sure that they put out their best team every week at the moment? Um, yeah, I agree with that, mate. I think you know, majority of the majority of the time when, when the Wallabies play, we need to be putting out our best team, um, especially in the current environment. I think... Um, we don't have a lot of depth. We're working on that, you know, right through. You know, all the five provinces are working on that. Um, 
So yeah, look, look Scott Farty's a loss. I'm a real big fan of his. I'm, I'm really happy for him that he's he's come in and he's um and he's made a fist of 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 Test rugby because I just think he's tailor made for it. He's an uncompromising type of player. He doesn't take any shit, um, and he and he rips in uh, every time. And he and he's got that knack of being able to just bend the rules a little bit. And and quite often that's the difference between. You know the good sides and the sides that are getting beaten is that they they just probably get away with a little bit more through through the through the referee's eyes. So um, he's he's one of the best I think in our current squad that do that. Um, and and yeah, he'll certainly be a loss. Hooper's been um, Hooper's been okay. Obviously, he's he's won the the John Hills uh, medal um, pre tour and um, he's that's well deserved uh, by him. And he just I think with him he's sort of. He's not as big as Pocock, so at times he can be a little bit, um, you know, not as dominant at, 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 at the breakdown as, as Pocock is. So it'll be interesting when, when he does get back on the paddock next year, um, Pocock, and, and, and the effect he, he'll have and, and, and the pressure he'll put on, obviously, Hooper in the selection going forward into, into next season. It'll be an interesting battle to watch. Um, Number eight wise, obviously we're missing a couple of players there. Um, we we talked talked about Scott Higginbotham earlier in the in the interview, and um, you know I'd I'd have him in there at number eight. I reckon he's um I reckon he's he's had a great season for for the Rebels this year. He's he's certainly got some uh, some weaknesses and some areas to work on, but he's certainly got that X factor. He, he's a he's a brilliant line out jumper, very similar I guess in a lot of ways to um to Ben Mullen, but. Uh, you know, I just really think his his carry and, and, and his ability to sort of uh, provide a bit of aggression into the pack. Uh, we, we, we'll see him sort of push forward next year, hopefully, in, 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 into that selection frame. I agree with what you said earlier, Matt, and I can't see that the Wallabies can be affording to rest players. They've got to pick their best 23, put their best 15 out on the park. As I've already said, I think up front, that means we've got to try James Slipper at tight head and bring Ben Robinson in to loose head to change the starting front row. Stephen Moore's got to stay there, even though he's played a lot of rugby. I'd like to see Tatafu Pilota now make a return, come through the bench. He can certainly make impact, maybe give him 20 minutes towards the end. I think James Hall will, will definitely be starting. He played quite well. Uh, if Rob Simmons is fit, I think he's got to come back in. Uh, I can't see that Sileki Tamani deserves a spot on the bench. Kane Douglas did quite well when he came on, so I think he should be the bench lock. It's pretty clear that with Scott Fardy out, Ben Moen will move to six, and Ben McCallum will come in and start at eight. Then the question becomes who's going to cover the back row from the bench, and given that Dave Dennis filled that role in Bledisloe 03, you'd imagine that he's going to be there. In terms of the back line, I can't see any change. As I said, I thought the back line performed quite well, apart from Will Genia, but there's no pressure coming from Nick White after his performance. So I think they'll start with exactly the same starting back line and the same bench players for the back line as well. In terms of tactics for this match against Italy, I know Dario has said that they're trying to play a more expansive game, but you know there's still going to be a lot of reliance on those tight forwards and obviously their back row. I think the Wallabies against England, when they came out in that second half, they came out with clear direction to play field position, play a more conservative game. There was a lot of kicking. I just don't think that suits this Wallaby team. I think they need to keep playing through the entire match. So that's something I really hope we see on the weekend. All right, Matt, now the hard question. What's your tip for the Wallabies against Italy on the weekend? Oh look, I'll always, I'll always be tipping Australia. I think I, it'll be, it'll be tough. I, I mean, I've, I've played a test in Italy myself, and even though we won it fairly comfortably in the end, it was, um, it was a battle. Um, I, I do remember it, uh, it bucketing down rain in the second half, and um, I reckon the raindrops were the biggest raindrops I've ever seen. So it, it, filled, it filled the whole stadium up. But um, we managed to get away with that one. And uh, look, hopefully that they'll be able to do that again this, um, this weekend. And Dario, can you give us a prediction of what you see happening in the match? Uh, well, for what might happen in the match, uh, Australia by uh, could win by ten or seven points. It would be, uh, I think, a, a, a close match, but Australia will uh, will gain uh, uh, will gain it. I think so. That's what I think. 
Well, I think the Wallaby fans would take any win at the moment. So uh, <laughs> let's see how we go. But Dario, thanks very much for joining us from the other side of the world. And uh, I hope you enjoy the match on the weekend. And Matt, I know you're really busy with preparations for next year. Good luck with that. Thanks for taking the time to come on. Anytime, Scott. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Thanks, mate. Thanks for your time. Join me again next week in the lead-up to the Wallabies match against Ireland.